Welcome to Harvest Mission Community Church. You are listening to one of our sermons. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 15 all the way through verse 23. And as many of you know, we're focusing in on Missions Month. How many of you have been enjoying it? Can I get a good amen? Amen. Amen. My heart and my hope and my prayer is that through this Missions Month, you will understand more about the heart of God. What is it that He is desiring for you as you begin to understand more of His heart for people and for missions? This is what our church is about, and I've shared this uh, many, many times And I am praying that some of us will really capture this through not just life group, but in Sunday and everything that we do. Um, That's why we have said very clearly, there are many different churches here in Hong Kong, great churches. I know most of the pastors of the international churches. And so if you feel like this is not the right church, then please find another one where you can be rooted. But if this is it, I'm going to tell you ahead of time, you're going to be challenged. You're going to be challenged with the mission of God the heart of God, and I pray that all of us will respond because we ourselves have experienced the gospel message. So I wanted to start off with this question. I'm wondering how many of you are able to describe something as a counterfeit? Now, some of us are a little better than others, uh, depending on the bag, uh, depending on the watch, depending on maybe the shirt, whatever it may be. But how would you describe something that is a counterfeit? So what I want us to do is please take out your phone. Everyone take out their phone. And as you take out your phone, some of you are like, yeah, this is a counterfeit. How did he know? I I don't know. (laughs) But if you take out your phone, go ahead and we're going to ask you to scan this QR code. And this is how I want to be able to start off and ask the question simply this. What word or words would you use to describe something as being counterfeit? So what word or words would you use to describe something as being counterfeit. So go ahead and scan that. And in a short while, we're going to show this word cloud so that from this room right here, you will know exactly what other people are thinking when you're trying to describe the word counterfeit. Okay? (laughs) All right, it's slowly uh, developing here. So we have scam, lower quality, better than nothing. See, this is... (laughs) This is a person with a poverty mindset, okay? Let me just be clear on this, all right? Poverty mindset. Cheap, not real, imitation, poor quality. Bamboozled, I like that word, right? All right, look look at all these words. Cheap, bad, deceitful. I don't see Taobao. Come on now. Oh, there is a Taobao. Wow, amazing. Uh, No offense to any of you who love or work for Taobao. We love you. Look, okay, we'll we'll just give about 10 more seconds here. So look at all these words. Copy, you know, we see the Taobao there. Low quality, made in China, hey, hey, hey. Come on now. Okay, all right. So you see it right here. This is what people in this room think when they think about the word counterfeit. Let me give you the Merriman Webster's dictionary definition of counterfeit. It defines it in this way, made in imitation of something else with intent to deceive. Another definition of that is something likely to be mistaken for something of higher value. And third and lastly, to try to deceive by pretense or dissembling, which means misleading. And as many of you know, the master of all counterfeits is Satan. In fact, he's known with his title as the father of lies. Listen to what it says in John chapter 8, verse 44 in the NIV. It says this, and read the yellow section with me. It says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is what? No truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is what? Let's say this, a liar and the father of lies. He is the master of counterfeits. 
And what does he counterfeit? He counterfeits anything that is good, anything that God has created, and he declares that is good, and he uses it in such a way that we will draw further away from worshiping Jesus Christ. In order to help us to understand the ploys in which Satan uses to deceive us, I want to show you this quick uh, video of a spoken word. Some of you might know him, uh, Jefferson uh, Beckney, and uh, he actually talks about this counterfeit God that we worship. Uh, there's some parts a little bit provocative. So I, I don't know why I have to keep on giving tr trigger warnings. But anyway, just in case, th th there might be, I, I don't even know which part of it was, but just, you could just go to sleep for a while. But he's going to say some stuff, real stuff. See, I like things that are authentic. Not to say that it has to be you know, really crazy, but in a way that's real so that we, we know what that feels like. We know what they're talking about. And so he's going to talk about counterfeit gods that we worship as followers of Jesus Christ. So let's watch this together. I don't know if you understood all of it, but all I can say is a great reminder that every single one of us in this room, we worship a counterfeit God. I liked it how he ended in the gospel message that it's only in the gospel of Jesus Christ that you can actually be set free. I think all of us struggle with the worship of people and things. So instead of worshiping Jesus alone, who is worthy that we talked about last week, we end up worshiping other things and other people. In fact, I want to challenge us just to look at your lives. Let's examine our lives and see the gods that we have placed above Jesus Christ, our Lord. Some of you might be sitting there, well, I, I don't really know what they are. Well, let me quote you, Tim, Timothy Keller, who in his book wrote Counterfeit Gods. In fact, I want to really encourage some of you, if you want to learn more about this, this is going to be eye-opening for you, the way he presents of how we worship so many other gods. Listen to what he says. He says this. What is an idol? It is anything more important to you than God. It is anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. A counterfeit God is anything so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. An idol has such a controlling position in your heart that you can spend most of your passion and energy, your emotional and financial resources on it without a second thought. It can be family and children or career and making money or achievement and critical acclaim or saving face or social standing. It can be romantic relationship, peer approval, competence and skill, secure and comfortable circumstances, your beauty or your brain, a great political or social cause, your morality, your virtue, or even success in the Christian ministry. An idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of, uh, heart of hearts, if I have that, then I'll feel my life has meaning. Then I'll know I have value. Then I'll feel significant and secure. If anything becomes more fundamental to, than God to your happiness, meaning in life, and identity, that is an idol. There are many ways to describe that kind of relationship to something. And perhaps the best one is worship. So pretty much he covered all of us. That every single one of us in this room, we are idol worshipers. Whether you want to admit it honestly and authentically, or you don't, bottom line is every single one of us right now, we are worshiping something or someone. And the problem is every one of those things that we are worshiping, it always leads to heartaches and headaches. Because you have put Jesus Christ not in the center of your life, but he has been dethroned by some of these other gods and idols that you worship. Whatever controls you, Whatever affects you is your Lord, the Lord that you worship. So I want you to make this very practical. When you don't do well in school 
and you have anxiety and you freak out. That is your God, whether you want to admit it or not. It's so clear. It affects you. It controls you. That person that you like or you want to find approval from, and they don't give you the attention that you want. They don't say good job, and it affects you. Even though you're serving God and doing something that is Christ honoring, it affects you so much. So that person's approval has become your God. And so everywhere you look, you realize that our hearts are prone for idol worship and worshiping these counterfeit gods that do not fully satisfy. Continuing in his book, Tim Keller writes this. I thought this was helpful. One of the signs that an object is functioning as an idol is that fear becomes one of the chief characteristics of life. I want to pause here. If there is anything in your life that you are fearing, that has become your functional God. That is what you're believing that will satisfy you, that will give you significance, that will give you security, that will give you comfort, that will give you meaning in life. Do you know how many people right now in this room and those who are watching online, you are driven by fear. Whatever it is that you fear is the very thing that you worship. He continues and he says this, when we center our lives on the idol, whatever it may be, we become dependent on it. If our counterfeit God is threatened in any way, our response is complete panic. We do not say, what a shame, how difficult, but rather, this is my end. There's no hope. And once again, this morning, if we are completely honest and we're vulnerable and bare before God, we will have to say there are a lot of things that we're worshiping on a given day, given week, given month, given year. This is the reason why Jesus is not worshipped in the church. This is the reason why Jesus is not worshipped in the followers who call themselves the followers of Jesus Christ. This is the reason why there is no power in our spiritual lives to handle the things that we have to face in our lives. This is the reason why you get up in the morning and you wonder, what is my purpose in life? This is the reason why some of you, even at this very moment, might be contemplating suicide. This is one of the reasons that some of you might be going into depression. Now, I know there's many factors involved. A lot of hormonal things going on. The synapses in your mind. A lot of times, it's that worshiping of that God that has conditioned our mind to think a certain way. And you think something, you will feel something, and it will lead to action. So as we're continuing in this missions month, the title is No Other Name. There is no other name to be claimed as worthy. There is no other name that is to be worshipped than the name of Jesus Christ. That's what we want to talk about today. So let me give us the one thing. The one thing is simply this. Knowing that Jesus deserves our worship, we must joyfully yield to his lordship. When you know that he is deserving of all our worship, everything that we have, he is the only God. That is when there will be joy when we surrender and when we yield ourselves to his lordship, that he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. There are two things that I want us to remember as we know more and more that Jesus is worthy and deserving of our worship and how that will lead to surrendering and yielding ourselves to his lordship. The first thing is this, that Jesus preeminently displays his sovereign power. We have to experience this. We have to know this, that Jesus preeminently displays his sovereign power. Now, I know some of you, English is not your first language. So this idea of preeminence or preeminent, it simply means something that is superior, something that is far greater. It is outstanding, extraordinary, that is far above anything else in this world. That is what means to be preeminent. It is noteworthy. It is something that is far beyond what we have experienced. It is great. And that's why we see Jesus Christ, he alone is preeminent. And he does this as he displays his sovereign power. The Apostle Paul, as he's writing to the people of Colossae, he wanted them to remember that there is no God like Jesus Christ. 
That's very clear. If you look at the book of Colossians, even in Colossae, as they're worshiping all these other gods, he starts off after giving thanks for the people who are there. He starts off and he talks about the preeminence of Jesus Christ, why he is superior and greater than anything else and anyone else in this world. That's why we're going to turn and now to the passage, Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 15 through 18 first. Listen to what the Word of God says. It says this, He is, referring to Jesus Christ, He is the invis- uh, image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. In these three some verses, you will notice this three unique characteristic traits that, that makes Jesus preeminent in his sovereign power. That He is powerful above all things. Let me list those three things for you. The first one is this. Jesus is the image of God. In verse 15, the word image conveys this idea of something that is exact likeness or perfect representation. I don't know about you, but when you're young, you're wondering, what does God look like? You know, who is God? You begin to ask ask these questions. Well, all you have to do is look at to the person of Jesus Christ and you will see the exact representation, the image of God. Therefore, we see Christ is not simply like God, but he is God. That is something that we have to acknowledge. Jesus is simply the expressed image of this invisible God. So this invisible God was made visible through the life of Jesus Christ. That's why I like the message translation. It says this, we look at his son and we see the God who cannot be seen. Just look at Jesus and you'll be able to see God, the Almighty. He is not just a reflection, but the very nature and the character of God. He is perfectly revealed in Jesus Christ. If you remember, the Apostle John also talked about this because people were longing for the Messiah And he wanted people to understand that Jesus Christ is God. He is the Messiah. And he writes in John chapter 1, verse 18. I'm going to read it from the message translation. It says this. No one has ever seen God, not so much as a glimpse. This is a one of a kind God expression who exists at the very heart of the Father, has made him plain as day. Look at John chapter 14, verse 9. And it says this. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long? And you still do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? So once again, Jesus clearly states that if you see me, you have seen the Father. That's why Paul took up to writing to the people of Colossae that Jesus Christ is the visible, the image, the exact representation, the perfect representation of the invisible God. Now, here's a second reason why, when we think about his preeminence being displayed through his sovereign power. The second thing is this, that Jesus is also the firstborn over creation. So not only is he the image of God, but he is the firstborn over all of creation. We see that in the Old Testament, those of you who are not familiar with the Bible, in the Old Testament, the significance of being firstborn or the first son being born is important because it means that they have a special place in the inheritance and other benefits that come within this Jewish family. That's why it, it's, 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 it carries over in, even into the Asian culture, especially the Korean culture. And I know this because I grew up in this Korean culture where I have an older sister, my sister Diane, and you know, I love her to death. But I will say, if if I look back into my life, because I am the oldest son, I was favored by my parents, whether knowingly or unknowingly, above my sister. Because why? Being the firstborn son in a Korean family is very significant. 
In the same way, it's like that in the Old Testament. Being the firstborn comes the inheritance, comes the benefits of being born first. But one thing you have to understand is this. Paul is not saying that Christ is first in a series of all these people that were born. That is not what he's saying. But rather, he is trying to communicate by being firstborn. That means that he is supreme and he is preeminent and he has the priority or rank above all other people on this earth. Do you see Jesus this way? The firstborn of all creation that takes this highest rank that no one else should worship or no one else can fill. Here's the third thing. Not only is he the image of God, the firstborn over all creation, but we see here Jesus is the creator of the universe. You see the preeminence in how creation was created. Because it says it was by him, through him, and for him. Come on, everyone say that together. By him. Let's, let's say it again, okay? Turn to someone next to you and say, let's get ready, all right? Everything was made by him, through him, and for him. Amen. These three prepositions, by, through, and for, shows that everything is about him. Now, I know this is going to break some of your bubbles. Life is not about you. Everything right now that you're doing, it's all about you. Just think about it. Why are you studying so hard? Because it's about you. So you can get a good job. But you, some of you can be altruistic and say, well, it's really about my family. I want to provide for them, which is great. But somehow you believe by doing that, you're going to bring happiness to them and they might approve of you. It's amazing how when you break everything down, things in life, it's about you. It's about me. And this is the war that continues to go on within our hearts, whether to worship ourselves or to worship this Jesus who is the image of God, the firstborn over all creation and the creator of all the universe. And the more you revolve your life around yourself, I'm going to tell you right now, the more chaotic your life will be. The more you order your life around Jesus Christ, the more order there is in your life. Now, some of us are thinking to ourselves, like, what is he saying? And I, I, I know sometimes when I say things, some, I, I, I can just tell on your faces. Well, first of all, some of you are slowly waking up. But it, l let, me, let me just say this. I'm realizing that when you don't have experience and you hear something, it just seems like he doesn't know. He doesn't understand me. Goes one through, uh, through one year and out the other. But you add experience into some of the stuff that I'm speaking every week, I guarantee you, your heads will not be going like that, but you'll be going, preach, preacher. Preach, preach. When we say that your girlfriend and boyfriend will not satisfy you, will not, it's not going to fulfill you, your life, something like, he doesn't want Please go out and get your heart broken. No, I'm, I'm not saying do that. <laughs> I got to be careful with my heart. I'm not saying do it to prove me wrong or anything. But I'm just simply saying those of us who have been there, done that, all of us can realize that no relationship can fill our hearts. Can I get a good amen to that? Amen. Wow, that's louder than when I say Jesus is Lord. Anyway. <laughs> that's a whole different sermon. <laughs> When I say your GPA is not everything in life, all the colleges are like, yeah, whatever. You, you don't go to something U and something K and something Hong Kong, something whatever, <laughs> university. But you talk to some of the working people, what would they say? It's not your whole life, man. You talk to people who are working so hard to get a lot of money to advance in their career and do all this stuff. And you talk to some of these people who are married, they have kids, and they're like, dude, man, or do that. Listen, girl, girl, listen, it's not going to fill your heart. Those of you who are single adults, through one year, not the other. Because he's a pastor, he doesn't make any money, so who cares, you know? <laughs> God 
God always provides. But some of you are like, who cares? But you talk to some of these older guys, they'll tell you. Working so hard and then you get a disease and you're on your deathbed, it's not worth it. It's just amazing how so many things are true as the Bible says, but unless we experience it, we're not going to really understand. So I'm going to say it again. When you revolve your life around yourself, it will be chaotic. But when you revolve your life around Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it will be orderly. And I have a gif to prove it to you. Listen to me carefully. Now, do not go, whoa, whoa. Just in your spirit, just go, mm, mm, this is good. It is what we call the heliocentric versus the deo, uh, a geocentric way of looking at the world. Those of you who are a little bit on the science side, you guys know the heliocentric is when the sun is at the center and everything orbits around the sun. The geocentric is when you put the earth where a lot of people, even those in the church in the early days, centuries and millennia ago, they would think to themselves, we are the center of the whole universe, the earth. And they quickly realized that that was not true that it revolves around the sun. It's not geocentric, but it is heliocentric. Are we ready with this? Okay, let's just watch this. The left is helio, the right is geocentric. They got this through stats of how the earth orbits and they projected what would happen if we revolve the world around the earth, which is on the right, or when we say that earth revolves around the sun. So cool. Let's watch it one more time. Just so to prove my point. The left is heliocentric. The right is geocentric. Okay. The reason why when you look at that picture or that mini video, your lives are like the right side. It is chaotic. It is a mess. Because everything is about you. It's about your life, your dreams, your time, your treasure, your comfort, your security. It's all about you. And you know what? You don't even have to say much. It's by your actions. You can say everything that you want to. I worship God. Jesus is my priority in my life. Hallelujah. You can do whatever you want to do, but it is your action that speaks louder than words. And many of you, your life is like that geocentric life where everything is about you in the center of the universe and everything orbits around it. And I'm telling you right now, it is going to be chaotic. But if you revolve your life around the sun, S-O-N, come, come on, Jesus. If you, if you put your life around the sun, then everything orbits around and there is a sense of order. Because that's how God designed it. That is how God designed it. That he alone should be worshipped. And we should worship no other gods as he's clearly commanded in the great... Uh, in the Ten Commandments. You should have no other gods before me. I'm wondering in the light of Jesus' preeminence over all creation, as he is the firstborn, the very image, the perfect representation of God, do you worship him? Do you center your life around him? And not asking Jesus to center his life around you. That's why in verse 18 we notice that Christ who is supreme in creation is also the head of the church. The word head is the connotation of a source or origin or the leader and the ruler. It's not Pastor Seth, but it is Jesus Christ who is the head shepherd. He is the head over the church, not only this church, but the church in Hong Kong and all over Asia and all over the world. He is the head of the church. 
That's why Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 to 23 in the New Living Translation says this. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fulfills all things everywhere with himself. What a great reminder this morning that he is the center of the church. He is the head of the church. That's why we should never put people above Jesus Christ in anything. We should never put a leader above Jesus Christ. How about us this morning? What is gripping and capturing our hearts? What are the idols and the counterfeit gods that we are worshiping and we're giving our allegiance to? Do you see the preeminence and the greatness of God through all creation, everything that he's doing? Sometimes you're able to see that when you make mistakes and you realize your life is struggling because you realize, I cannot do this by myself. I need you, Jesus Christ. The second point is this. Jesus not only preeminently displays his sovereign power, but I want you to see in the last few verses that Jesus preeminently demonstrates his sacrificial provisions that Jesus preeminently demonstrates his sacrificial provision. Let's read verse 19. This is what it says in verse 19. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Now, I want to pause here because this is important. The word fullness refers to all of God's presence, all of his attributes, all of his glory, filling the earth, and it says God, is, God the Father is so pleased to have it dwell in His Son, Jesus Christ. In fact, the, in fact, the reason why this is so important is because you have to understand Jesus had to be so much different than anyone else or anything else on this earth to be the perfect sacrifice. I was always thinking about that. Why did Jesus have to come into this earth? Couldn't he get this super cow or super, I don't know, sheep or goat and then sacrifice that and the blood would be shed and we're set free? Why was Jesus Christ the one that came into this earth and died on the cross? The reason why is very simple. Because he had to live a perfect life. Something that you and I could not do. That's why we need Jesus, who lived the perfect life, who died the criminal's death that he did not deserve, that he became the perfect sacrifice to appease the wrath of God because of sin in this world. So this is why in Hebrews chapter 1, chapter 3, or chapter 1, verse 3 in the New Living Translation, read the yellow section with me. Listen to what it says. The sun, come on, say this, radiates God's own glory. So when you see Jesus, the glory of God radiates through his life. And it says this, and expresses the very character of God. You look at Jesus, you see the character of God. You see love, you see patience, you see sacrifice. All these traits, you see it in Jesus Christ. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. What a great reminder. I love how the NIV says that the sun is the radiance of God's glory and what? The exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. See, we we see the elements of the gospel now coming in as he first establishes that he is preeminent in all of creation and he displays it by creating all things. Now he demonstrates it. He doesn't just display it. He demonstrates who he is by the sacrificial provision and that is the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. This is the gospel. There are two things that Christ's sacrifice did for us. The first thing is this, that it reconciles us or it reconciled us with God. Let's read verse 20, 21, and 22. Listen to what it says. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which was to be proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, 
became a minister. I want you to focus on verse 20 through 22. I want you to focus in on those three verses first. Because you realize clearly that through Jesus' sacrificial provision by dying on the cross, it not only reconciled us with God, but he reconciled all things to himself. He made peace for us because we were enemies of God, but he made peace for us when he shed his blood on the cross. This idea of being hostile or alienated in our minds by doing evil. We're, we're hating God. When God says, submit your life to me, and we hate him because we don't want to. Surrender this for me because I want you to worship me and not these other idols. We hate him in our minds, and we're hostile towards God because we want to do what we want to do. You see this even as a little child. When the parent goes, you know, little so-and-so, uh, we want you to do this. We want you to eat your vegetables or don't do that. What does a kid do? <laughs> you know, like, they get angry. That's being hostile and slowly alienating themselves from the parent. That's the very thing that happens to us when God commands us and we don't want to obey. We are saying, God, this is my life and I want to do what I want to do. Stop telling me what to do. I'm tired of even your servants telling me what to do. Stop nagging me and I will do what I want to do. But it's through the sacrifice of Jesus that we were in this condition, but through his sacrifice, he brought us back to God and reconciled us to God the Father. Let me just give you two verses to help you to understand how important this is. Romans chapter 5, verse 10 through 11. I want you to read the yellow section with me. It says this, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have, what, now received reconciliation. We were enemies of God, but through Jesus Christ and his sacrificial provision by dying on the cross, that we have now been reconciled. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through 20. You know this verse very well. Read the yellow section with me. It says this, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's important. He gave us now this ministry of reconciliation that God was what? Reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sin against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassador as though God was making his, were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So not only did he demonstrate his sacrificial provision to reconcile us, now he is giving to us this ministry and the ability to be reconciled with the world. So listen carefully. This is the reason why when you reconcile with somebody who has hurt you, you demonstrate the gospel. When you're able to reconcile with your mother or your father, when there's misunderstanding, it demonstrates the gospel. When you're able to reconcile with your roommate, even though there's been a lot of hurt over the past some months, what you do is you demonstrate, it demonstrates the gospel message in your life. I see so many people in their own insecurity, the fear of rejection, because they might get rejected. If you go to somebody and say, hey, I've been really hurt, they go, who cares? You deserve to be hurt. Well, it's going to be more hurt. This is the reason why, because it's your pride. It's your insecure pride, because you're afraid that instead of speaking truth in love, that when you say something, you're going to be rejected. That's why it's better to just hide. It's just better not to say anything. It's better to just kind of be very, all the pleasantries and very nice. But in your heart, you're murdering them as the scripture tells us that you, you might not have committed murder, but you've committed murder in your heart because you hate them. God has reconciled you through Jesus Christ to himself by this incredible sacrifice. And then for you to hold on to whatever you're holding on to, you're making the world about you. 
Instead of taking the message of reconciliation, showing to the world, demonstrating to the world, I know the gospel. The gospel has transformed my life. Instead of being able to declare that through your life, you're declaring another message. This is the very thing that causes people to go to some of the hardest places in the world and share the gospel and willing to die for it because they realize that they themselves have been reconciled to God. They are forever grateful for this sacrificial provision. This is the reason why there are so many people who have experienced the gospel message. They're willing to lay their dreams and lay their own self, selfish ambitions and say, God, whatever you want me to do, I'm yours. See, the problem with cults and even just other religions and other, whatever you want to call it, worships that center around man is that we do a lot of the similar things, but we do it with the wrong motive. You look at every other religion. You look at every single cult. They're doing all these things so they can be approved by God. But we as followers of Christ, genuine followers of Christ, we do the same things, but what? We do it because we received already. We have been loved already. We have been accepted already. We have been approved by God already. We have been lavished with His unconditional love and forgiveness. And therefore, our hearts are moved. And we're saying, God, how can I live and lay down my life? How can I ever repay you? And the Bible tells us we can never repay Him. But we are now debtors of love. If you have experienced this love, you are a debtor of this love to God. You will never be able to repay Him. But one thing you can do is with your one life, you can live for His glory and for His honor. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit too excited here. You know what the second thing is? Not only this provisional sacrifice, not only does it reconcile, but I want you to know it restores us. Look at verse 23 again. I want you to look at 23 one more time. Listen to what it says. If indeed you continue in the faith, established and set fast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which I have been proclaiming in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Let's, let's go back a couple more. But let's just go through the whole thing. Listen to what it says. What is he mentioning? He is saying, now we've been reconciled in verse 22 that now we can present our bodies holy and blameless. So now what he's doing, he's restoring us. If you continue in this faith, not shifting from the hope of the gospel, this is what we proclaim. Now we have become this model. So think about who Paul was before he became a Christian. He was a religious guy, killing Christians, doing all this incredible evil stuff, but, he's, but he thought he was doing it out of his zeal for God. But God now restores him, and no longer is he an enemy of Christianity, but now he's a champion of Christianity to proclaim Jesus Christ. That's a complete reversal. That's what happens when there's restoration, that God will bring back into order and restore what it was supposed to be. That's why when you see relationships being restored again, it's a powerful thing. If you don't believe me, go watch Korean dramas. And if you think about... I, I, yeah, you know, any, any movie, drama, TV show you cry in, there's a gospel element in there. Can I get a good amen to that? So next time you see someone crying, watching a Korean drama, say, you're experiencing the gospel. So am I, you know. God is restoring us. Relationships being restored. Our purpose is being restored. No longer do we do things for ourselves, but it's for the kingdom of God. That res restoration of purpose, passion, all these things is for the glory of God. The word stable, as we read in verse 23, it means established or grounded in the sense of a foundation. No wonder in other translations, but you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. Listen to what the message translation says. Even though it's a colloquial phrase, phrasing of it, it'll help you to understand it. It says, you don't walk away from the gift like that. You stay grounded and steady in the bond of trust, constantly tuned into the message, careful not to be distracted or diverted 
So as you are being reconciled and restored, now everything is reordered. So you will not be distracted or diverted, but you're able to live for the purposes of God. There is no other message, just this one. And Paul took God's reconciliation and this message that he was given to by God and declared himself the servant of this gospel. Therefore, in what was lost, God restores Paul's purpose in life. I'm just wondering if some of you have lost the original purpose. Maybe you just made it about you somewhere along the line and you realize, God, like, no wonder my life is a mess. It's no longer about me, but it's about you. That's why the one thing that I shared earlier on is simply this. Knowing that Jesus, who's the creator of all things, the firstborn, the very representation, the image of God, when we know that he deserves all our worship, that is when we will be joyfully willing to yield to his lordship because he is the king. He is the Lord. What do you do with a message like this? We're going to make it practical with some things that you have to respond to God with. If he really is supreme and preeminent over all things, we cannot keep on living our lives the way we're living it. Everything has to be brought in order. So can I just suggest some, some things to pray about, think about, and even live it out this coming week so that you could experience a transformation in your heart that only God can do through the Spirit of God. The first thing is this, confess your need for Christ. You know, so often we, we go through life and this is the last thing we confess because we don't want to be weak. We want to be known as competent. We want to be known as strong. We want to be known as someone who could do all this stuff. But I'm telling you right now, the, the place that you need to be, you and I need to be, is this place of confession of our need for God. As soon as you start confessing your need for God, it's almost as if the heavens just open up. Your heart begins to open up. You no longer try to protect yourself. Your heart begins to open up and all of heaven comes in such a powerful way. The kingdom of God, the reality of the kingdom of God demonstrates itself right there, right there in your life in that place of humility and brokenness. Confess your need for God. The second thing is this. Center your life around Christ. It's no longer Seth-centric, but it's Jesus Christ-centric, the heliocentric. Let everything revolve around Christ. You know, a lot of times I meet Christians, really good Christians, they love the Lord, and they say things that sometimes I kind of wince at because I realize I know what they're saying, but they're saying it in a way that's not really true. We'll say things like, make Jesus your priority. Put him number one in your life. And then it will be like family, your job. and the, you know, you, It's like a hierarchical order. And I always tell people that is not a good imagery of what it means to center your life around Christ. I always tell people, think about a wheel. And in this wheel, there's a hub in the middle. That's where Christ should be. And as time passes by, as we go through life, the wheel will sometimes start turning. Sometimes you got to focus on your studies. Sometimes you got to focus on what you do. Sometimes you got to drop all that and focus on your family because there's, there's something going on. So when you start prioritizing in an order, then you might do things that might not be pleasing to God in that moment. So I always tell people, think about the wheel. Put Christ in the center. He is the hub. And all the spokes are all your responsibilities and friendships and things that you got to do. And the wheel keeps on turning. There will be moments and time where you have to put certain things above other things that are good because of the situation. So when you put Christ in the center and your life revolves around Christ, then no matter what happens in your life, the priorities might shift. But no matter what happens in your life, as you put Him in the center, he will always be Lord. Can I get a good amen to that? Amen. amen. Don't put him, and this might sound really crazy, don't put him number one and then put this number two. Put him in the center. 
and all the spokes may be the things that you're responsible for. And as it turns, you trust in God to help you through those things. The third thing is this, cut out the distractions. Some of you right now are living your life with these counterfeit gods and they are distracting you from loving God and worshiping Him. I'm going to be very bold this morning and I'm going to tell you this. Some of you are living in sin and you got to cut that out. Cut it out of your life. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but I'm challenging you. If you love Jesus Christ and He is the center of your life, by His grace as you confess your need for Him, may He give you the strength to cut that distraction out of your life. Because God, I love you more than you fill in the blank. Some of us, I understand, you're addicted. You are, you are in bondage. That much more you need to confess your need for God. That much more you need to say, God, Jesus Christ, be in the center of my life. I need you. Help me. I would even say maybe share with one other person who you trust and you know that they love you. That they could take whatever you tell them that it's horrid and it's evil, all the stuff that goes on in your mind and in your heart be able to confess that and just receive his love, receive his forgiveness as they pray for you. You got to cut out the distractions in your life, those things that divert you from worshiping Jesus Christ. And the last thing is this, commit to a life of worship. You know, a lot of times when we think of worship, we think of singing, which is not bad. But I want you to start changing your mindset. When you think about worship, think of it as living your life with everything that you have to give praise and honor and glory to Jesus Christ. So when you go to work, when you commit to worship, being Jesus, that you go there saying, God, thank you for this job that I have. Even though I might not like it at times, thank you for this job that I have. Thank you, Lord, that I can pay the bills. Thank you, Lord God, that I am surrounded by people who don't know you. This is my mission field. This is where I share the gospel. This is where there's a purpose of why I go to work. It's not just to make money. In the same way for some of us, it's just a life of worship simply means, God, thank you for this class. I don't like it. The professor is really bad. One of the worst professors I had in my life. But Lord, there's only 1% of the whole world's population. Now it's 8 billion people who have an opportunity to study at higher education. And I even got a scholarship at that. And it's free. Thank you, Lord, for the provisions in my life. I'm going to go to this class because I know that there are people who are hurting, people in my class who are struggling. And I want to be a beacon call to them, a light to the world to go into that place and to do the project well. Yes, you don't have to do everything, but be participating in that project so people can say you work differently something's different about you and through that they will be drawn into who you are in Jesus Christ and you get to share the gospel life of worship is even when you perform or do anything you do the best of possible because you represent Jesus Christ that's why we value excellence it's not for our exaltation because anyone who hears who sees who touches who are experiencing it we want them to say this is so awesome I've never experienced anything like this that the God that you worship must be so great because you are willing to do everything possible to the best that's why I kept on saying if Michael Jordan became a Christian everyone will come, come to know the Lord I'm just being exaggerating here. It's a euphemism. Think about it. Somebody like, who are Michael Jordan? You, you're, you're too young. Just the greatest of all time. That's why when you do a project and it, it excels, it's like far above. People are like, wow. You get their attention, not for yourself, so that they can say, hey, what's going on? When you do work, and it's excellent work, when they see that, they'll be like, what motivates you to do stuff like that? You can tell them, well, I'm very passionate about this, and also, I have a greater purpose. I have a higher purpose. Where's that purpose? Well, see, because I was like this one time, and I was so lost, and Jesus found me. And that's why my whole life is dedicated to living for Him. I guarantee you, if you're the best in anything you do, people will want to hear who this Jesus is. Some of you are satisfied with mediocre work. If I was a pre-Christian, no wonder I would not follow you or follow your religion, your Jesus. Pay attention to the little details. Do things well so that people can see what motivates you. 
That's why you should study hard. That's why you should go to work. That's why you should do things, honoring him as he is in the center. I love what Sinclair Ferguson said. Listen, listen to what he said in his book, A Heart for God. He says this on page 79. He says this, God is God. You are but one of his creatures. Your only joy is to be found in obeying him. Your true fulfillment is to be found in worshiping him. Your only wisdom is to be found in trusting and knowing him. Did you get that? The true fulfillment in this life is found in worshiping him, Jesus Christ. As many of you know, several years back, in the height of the pandemic, and especially as it was just getting started, uh, there was a song called The Blessing. And it was sung at the first time in the States uh, at a church. And somehow that song, song resonated with so many people. Why? Because they were under this situation where there, there was no hope. And the song, which is the, the ironic blessing from the book of Numbers, Aaron the priest gave this blessing to the people of God. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May his shalom, his peace, rest upon you. And not only to you, but to your family and to their families and to generation after generation. And that song literally took off in so many churches. Many of you know that song. But the part that was really powerful was that they started translating that song into all different languages. So I want to show you this video because it is the blessing song that somebody compiled in all the, they literally went through all the YouTube videos, combined it all together to make this the world blessing song. And the reason why I want to show you is this. If Jesus Christ is preeminently displaying his sovereign power, and if Jesus Christ is preeminently demonstrating his sacrificial and he has demonstrated his sacrificial provision now he's reconciling the world to himself and i just pray that there will be a declaration of the greatness and the goodness of god through jesus christ that one day from every tongue and every tribe every nation will gather and sing the song of jesus christ as i mentioned before it occurred to me not too long ago that there are 48 nations in Asia, which included the Middle East and the North Africa region. That is all part of Asia. And we've been envisioning of reaching the circle, that Hong Kong be in the center and we're reaching out to the circle, this population where the 53 of the world's population resides in the circle. If you just talk about Asia in general, we're talking about two-thirds of the Muslim population is right here in Asia. 97% of Hindus are right here in Asia. 97, 98% of the Buddhists are right here in Asia. We are living in a time where Jesus Christ in his preeminence is giving us this message of reconciliation because as we begin to worship him, that we're calling others to worship along with us, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I don't know what you are revolving your life around, but unless your life revolves around Jesus Christ, it's going to be chaotic. I pray that we will say, God, whatever, whenever, however, it doesn't matter. My whole life is yours. I want to show you this video afterwards and come together, pray and close out, and let's just focus on Jesus. He alone is worthy of all our praise. Let's watch it together. I told you, African brings a different spirit. It went techno all of a sudden in the middle of it. I, I don't know what you envision when everything's all said and done. But I'm praying that the picture that we see in Revelations, where Apostle John saw this vision of every single tongue, tribe, nation gathered together, singing holy, 
is our God. Salvation belongs to our God and to no one else who alone is worthy of all the praise, glory, and honor. When I look around and you think about all these nations that are represented, even just in this song, to think about many of these people who still do not know the name of Jesus, or they might know it, but they don't bow down to worship at the name of Jesus. All I can say to you, if, if it doesn't move your heart, and you are a believer, that you have made Christianity all about you. As D.T. Niles have said, Christianity is one beggar showing another beggar where to find food. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And when you have experienced the goodness of the gospel message, you want to go to the ends of the earth to share this message. That doesn't mean that not all of you are going to go far away places. But you will be a supporter of missions. Whether it's through finances, whether it's through different projects or different things. You will be involved because your heart burns and aches when you think about who Jesus Christ is. And he alone is worthy of all our praise. And there are people who are worshiping all these counterfeit gods and all these other idols. And they don't know who this Jesus is. So we want to be able to share this good news. But until we worship him first, we're not going to gladly yield ourselves to the Lordship of Christ. Because we're making ourselves the center. We don't want to do that anymore. We want to be able to trust. We want to be able to give of ourselves and worship Jesus Christ alone. I'm going to ask us at this moment, if you could just bow your heads with me. And just close your eyes for a moment. I want you to think about that picture that I showed you. When your life is run by you being in the center, it is going to be chaotic. But when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is in the center and everything revolves around Him, your life will be so different. It's going to be in order because that's what Jesus Christ that's what it was created to do and we were created to be and with that picture in mind I want you to ask yourself which one describes my life right now if it is the one on the right where you are in the center I want to invite you to take this time to confess your need for him Repent of the self-centeredness, selfishness, your own dreams, your own goals. And say, God, I want my life to revolve around you. Some of you are trying to do your best by God's grace to have your life revolve around Jesus Christ. Some of the decisions you're making, some of the things that you have to confront. But maybe right now in your heart you're feeling kind of weak and you're like, God, I don't know if I can do this on my own. I want to invite you to pray for his sovereign power to come into your life to help you to make that decision. Many of us will have decisions that we have to make that will either honor God, glorify God, or honor ourselves and glorify our own name. Let's pray for strength. Let's pray for God's grace so that as we do make these decisions, even though it might seem as a loss to us, God in His mercy and in His grace will multiply whatever it is that we feel like we are losing for something that's even greater. 
So can I invite us for about a minute, minute and a half, let's just surrender our lives, our hearts over to Jesus right now and tell him you alone are worthy of everything that we have. Let's pray together. Can we just do that in one voice? see this as just a place you go to we are a family a spiritual family and we are just as much concerned about that person next to us in front of us behind us as much as we're concerned about our own lives if one person succeeds and does well in their relation with God everyone succeeds if one person is struggling we're all struggling so I'm going to encourage us, can we just do this? Can we just join hands together? If you don't feel too comfortable, you could just lock arms. And let's just show visible display of unity with one another as a family of God. And this is what I want us to pray. For. Just for about 30 seconds, I want you to pray that our church will be a church that exalts and lives for Jesus Christ. That anyone who steps into our life group, our Sunday, any, any meeting that we have, that they will be able to see and know who Jesus Christ is because we're living for him, we're worshiping him, we're exalting him. So I want us together one voice for the next 30, 40 seconds. Let me just pray for that, for our church. We will exalt the Lord. Thank you for listening to the Harvest Mission Community Church Podcast. For more information, visit our website at hongkong.hmcc.net.